I'd like to welcome everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dawn Smenko, the LFA Wisconsin Chapter CEO. Thank you for joining us for this month's Let's Talk About It webinar, Lupa Self-Management Tools, brought to you by the LFA Chapter Network. I'd like to introduce our staff members who will be with us today. Betsy Woody is our co-host today and our health, ed health education coordinator. And Angie Eckley is our administrative and content coordinator will also be helping out. Just as everyone's lupus is different, so are the medical and therapeutic treatments for lupus. Your physician knows your medical history best and is the best person to help in, in your treatment of your lupus. You can discuss information learned here today with your doctor, but do not make any changes to your medication or treatments without consulting your physician. This webinar is being recorded. Presenting today is Dr. Shivani Garg, who is a faculty member in the Division of Rheumatology within the Department of Medicine at UW Health. She is interested in clinical epidemiology of lupus, rheumatological diseases, and quality improvement projects in rheumatology. Dr. Garg helped establish the first lupus clinic in Wisconsin in 2018 and serves as medical director of the UW Health Lupus and Lupus Nephritis Clinics in Madison. Following Dr. Garg's presentation, we will open it up for questions. And if you have one, please click on the raise your hand icon or type your question in the Q&A, not the chat, and we will call on you. So welcome Dr. Garg and thank you so much for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. Thank you, Dawn, a uh, pleasure being here. Um, I would share my screen. So can everybody see, see my screen okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I would be talking about lupus self-management tools. Um, the next 20 uh, minutes or so, we'll talk about the common triggers of lupus, um, how to avoid common triggers to prevent flares and um, severe uh, mild, moderate or severe flares. And also we'll talk about some self-monitoring symptoms um, of a lupus flare just to know more um, what to monitor for, um, how can we predict or uh, identify those subtle symptoms uh, and when to call your physician. Um, let's start with something uh, which is known. Uh, we know that uh, fem female patients or women often get more lupus, nine times a higher risk of getting lupus compared to our male patients. Uh, there are ongoing studies that have shown that there could be a correlation with um, estrogen or the extra X chromosome in females, but still we are trying to figure uh, that out, like how, how this is leading to a more female predominant presentation. Uh, we all are aware that lupus affects people of color more often, and not only they have uh, more um, Inflammy, uh, more lupus uh, presentation, but they also suffer from severe lupus and do get diagnosed at a younger age. Uh, next is the hered hereditary predisposition. So there is an association of 30% when an identical twin could develop lupus if his or her cyst, uh, identical twin does have uh, lupus. And there is a five to 10% uh, genetic predisposition or risk in first uh, degree family members or relatives or a paternal twin um, uh, to develop lupus. Then some common triggers that you're all aware of, sunlight, uh, especially the UV rays, viral infections or infections in general, stress and smoking. So, uh, and then we're all aware, or maybe not that aware of sulfur medications. Um, so there is anecdotal evidence that sulfur medications can lead to hypersensitivity in patients who have lupus. And uh, there are some case reports or studies that have shown that uh, sulfur containing medications, especially antibiotics like Bactrim can lead to lupus flares. So just being, uh, having a caution around sulfur medications would be a good idea. So now that we know or have brushed our um, 
knowledge about triggers. Let's talk about how these triggers interplay at um, a cellular level. So we talked about our common triggers, UV rays, uh, viruses, uh, stress, sulfur, and smoking. When um, a patient who has a genetic predisposition or other reasons to develop lupus or has lupus, when these um, triggers get exposed to that patient, um, there is a lot of destruction and cell damage that occurs. And that cell damage leads to formation of antibodies. And those are the anti-nuclear antibody or ANA antibody that we are all aware of. So triggers lead to more antibody production, antibodies do the inflammation. So then the uh, patient or a person is uh, tied up in this vicious circle of inflammation. So moving forward, um, now that we know our triggers, uh, we know how they affect the at cellular level and lead to more formation of antibodies or ANA. And then let's talk about how we can avoid um, these triggers or um, can um, incorporate in a lifestyle uh, change. So the first and foremost trigger is sunlight. Um, so sunscreen use, um, uh, SPF 30 or minimum is a good idea. Um, uh, often we only uh, use sunscreens on the exposed uh, body parts, but it would be a good idea to put it on unexposed and exposed body parts just because the clothing that we uh, usually wear is not UV protective. Um, also, one thing to keep in mind is that sunscreen uh, often stays only for two to three hours with perspiration or sweating, it often, uh, the action is not there. So reapplying um, sunscreen after two to three hours is a good idea. There have been studies that have shown that patients who use sunscreen regularly compared to who don't, uh, the patients who are using sunscreen do tend to have less flares compared to those who do not use sunscreen. Other ways of protecting ourselves from sun, um, sunlight or UV rays is by using UV protective clothing or wearing hats. Um, the direct sunlight often during 10 to 4 p.m. is uh, um, has a lot uh, has very high UV index, so it can lead to uh, flares even after shot exposures. So trying to like limit the exposure during that period would be a good idea. And then moving on to like what medications can help um, reduce uh, such kind of flares after common exposures. Hydroxychloroquine is a key medication. Um, hydroxychloroquine medication uh, studies have shown that patients who take hydroxychloroquine not only tend to flare less, but also they have prolonged survival compared to patients who do not take it. And there are uh, there is increasing evidence on vitamin D supplements. Uh, vitamin D supplement, vitamin D deficiency or reduced uh, low levels. Um, there are studies that show that that can increase the risk of flares. So taking vitamin D supplements regularly is always a good idea. And if the levels are low, taking the high uh, supplement and rechecking the levels could prevent. Uh, some sunsvidi could prevent some of the flares from occurring. The next common trigger that we talk about is stress. Stress can be physical, can be mental, emotional. Um, so there could be different forms of stresses that we get exposed to in our day-to-day -day life. So uh, trying to avoid stress, uh, which is inevitable, but trying to manage stress better is a good idea to prevent some of these flares from happening. Stresses like uh, stressors um, could be anywhere, but uh, some str strategies like meditation, yoga, um, have shown that they can improve stress and reduce some of the quality of life patients experience. And also, there is a new strategy called mindfulness-based stress reduction program that could also help um, process stress and. Um, uh, with mindfulness-based uh, strategies or techniques and help uh, reduce stress or manage or cope up with stress better. Um, some studies have shown that so, such activities definitely leads to less stress, better quality of life, and less flares. So managing stress is important, especially in patients who have lupus, to uh, control or keep lupus as, at bay. 
Moving along, we talked about infections, specifically virus, uh, viral infections, and some bacterial infections or infections in general. So the key ways of preventing that, um, infections is by vaccination. Common infections like flu, um, pneumococcal pneumonia related pneumonia um, can lead to trigger, uh, are all triggers and they can lead to flares in patients with lupus. So it's a good idea to get vaccinated or, or get the prophylactic vaccination whenever you can. We talked about mindfulness-based stress reduction program and just wanted to highlight that there are studies that have shown that it improves the quality of life that patients experience by experiencing less stress and less flares. So that could be a strategy uh, that could be considered to manage or avoid some of the triggers. And now moving to sulfur. So we talked about sulfur um, hypersensitivity. So uh, there are studies that show that uh, lupus patients could be hypersensitive to sulfur uh, compared to other patients. And there are case reports that have shown that pay, uh, at times sulfur exposure can lead to a lupus flare. So just a caution around sulfur medication um, when first prescribed should be a good idea, or if there are some subtle symptoms that indicate that there could be a lupus flare preventing uh, such use or using alternatives could be a good idea. And the last and for uh, the most important is uh, smoking. We all know that smoking can lead to lupus flares. So quitting smoking is a good idea to reduce lupus flares. But what we don't know is that when we smoke, a lot of these good medications that we use for lupus, they're not uh, as effective as we want them to be. Specifically hydroxychloroquine, it does not remain that effective in patients who are smoking compared to who are not smoking. So reducing or trying to quit every time is a good idea. Also, uh, what we don't know is that smoking can increase the risk of heart disease. Lupus itself can increase the risk of heart disease. When we combine smoking with lupus, they both can expansionate um, or like increase um, the risk of heart disease uh, several folds. So quit smoking today or maybe cut down and plan about quit, uh, quitting smoking, not just because it would reduce the risk of having flares, uh, it, but it would make your medications more effective and also would reduce the risk of having heart disease. So just wanted to briefly talk, uh, talk about COVID vaccination um, in the pandemic, during the pandemic, um, we talk about vaccinations as prevention. So what about COVID vaccination and its safety in lupus? There have been these uh, several studies, but these two were big, uh, large, uh, large sample size studies. One was done in France, uh, the VACO loop study, which had six, um, 696 patients. And this study did report that only 3% of the patients suffered from med medically diagnosed lupus flare they did report that there were some reactions which were local reactions or some fatigue symptoms that were pre uh, perceived to be um, because of the vaccine, uh, but none of these symptoms progressed into a severe lupus flare requiring therapy. And the vaccination composition in the study was 55% uh, Pfizer, the mRNA vaccine, and then there were other vaccines in the remaining population or patients. Another study which has uh, 1,377 participants uh, looked at only patients who got uh, mRNA vaccine. This um, study did highlight that there were 11% 11, 11 reactions, uh, but none of these reactions were severe um, symptoms of lupus uh, or there were no severe flares of lupus. So the reactions which they noted were uh, local site reactions, maybe some uh, soreness in the arm, fatigue symptoms. Um, so just the usual ache, achiness or soreness in different joints, but no severe symptoms or flares of lupus. So overall, the conclusion was that COVID vaccinations do not increase the risk, significantly increase the risk of flare. And in comparison, 
COVID does increase the risk of having severe um, disease and poor prognosis if a lupus patient gets uh, infection and gets hospitalized. So contrast of the low risk of lupus flares, approximately 3%, or even lower and its benefit. Um, COVID, COVID vaccinations are recommended by Lupus Foundation of America, American College of Rheumatology and endorsed by CDC in all lupus patients. So that could be one strategy during the pandemic to prevent flares from happening um, by getting the vaccinations in time. So just to reiterate here, um, I, I pulled this uh, self-management goal setting from Lupus Initiative and uh, just wanted to highlight, highlight few things that we can work uh, to prevent triggers or uh, can incorporate in lifestyle to prevent flares. So one, uh, the first is healthy choices. So uh, some foods can cause antioxidants, um, do have high levels of antioxidants. Some foods can, um, can make us bloaty, feel different. So just knowing what suits to your body and trying to increase healthy diet, which is um, antioxidants, less off processed foods would be a good idea. And also balancing out the sodium and the salt intake, especially if we have kidney involvement, uh, that would be a good idea too. We talked a lot about reducing stress because stress can be in any form. Uh, it could be physical, it could be mental, it could be emotional, or it could be a combined of uh, everything. And especially with the pandemic, there is a lot of stress going on uh, with everything changing or everything looking different. So just trying to know what leads to stress and trying to know um, what can be done uh, or what works for you to de-stress yourself or to relax would be a good idea. Sometimes it could be as simple as listening to music. Sometimes it could be a yoga. Sometimes picking up the phone and talking with a family member could help. So just knowing what helps uh, would be a good idea to reduce the stress and prevent uh, lupus flares or in general, make your quality of life better. We should all try to aim for better emotional and social wellness. What it means is that uh, because at times, especially in pandemic, we feel so socially isolated or we felt so socially isolated. So just building on um, healthy relationships, uh, trying to make your family members or partners understand what, what lupus means or what lupus could cause or is causing helps. And sometimes if you cannot find support around because people cannot understand if they are not in the similar boat, then um, finding help outside uh, by joining support groups could be a good idea. Um, the next thing that can be a lifestyle management is being active. Uh, exercise, and sometimes it sounds like an um, vicious circle because if you do a lot, you hurt more, you feel fatigued, and then you don't want to do a lot. So why do we tell uh, patients or we tell people to be active? Um, so we understand that sometimes doing um, just that initial normal walk might not be normal because everybody is different and dealing with lupus makes your body different. But, but taking the first step is important uh, because it is important because your body feels different. So it cannot do the two mile walk as it would want to do. But doing a first like maybe 10 steps would be the first goal for the first week and maybe increasing every day. Um, would help uh, set uh, expectations, would help build um, stamina and reduce the symptoms that you feel. So just starting or thinking about getting active is the first step. And then not to, we are not recommending doing like two miles right away, just like building slowly on your stamina is the way to go, go around. But exercise does help release these endorphins, which are really helpful uh, for, um, for reducing stress, uh, not only stress, but also feeling good. So exercise helps with um, that part, but also exercise helps with reducing some of the things that we would see later in lupus, maybe heart disease, maybe uh, loss of uh, strength in the muscle, so, or maybe 
poor bo bone health, which means maybe higher risk of fractures. So exercise or being active helps your uh, helps reduce some of the emotional mental stress, but also makes your body stronger from inside. And then we talked about smoking. We cannot emphasize uh, more how much smoking can harm your body. It can harm not only, uh, we talked about lupus in general and heart disease, but we also see that it can increase the risk of having high blood pressure, which can worsen your kidney lupus. And often it can make your skin disease look bad, uh, worse or difficult to control. So just quitting, uh, taking the first step to cut down and then maybe quit on smoking is the way to go. So now just switching gears to talk more about self-management uh, from self-management to self-monitoring. So just knowing what these, uh, what the symptoms you could look, uh, what symptoms you could look around to uh, identify subtle or early symptoms before a full blown flare could happen. Com rash is a common uh, presentation. So there are more than 80% of patients would have some kind of skin manifestation with lupus. Uh, we all know the butterfly rash. Um, interestingly, the butterfly rash is more painful, uh, sometimes can be burning, can be itching just because it's an inflammatory rash. And uh, it does spare some of the nasolabial folds, uh, which, is, which are around the nose. And that could be because the malar or the cheek area is prominent and all of most of these rashes are triggered by UV or sun exposure. So uh, the, the prominent areas prevent uh, sunlight from falling onto the nasolabial folds. And that, uh, that is a key sign of lupus rash. So just knowing if it is more of a, a flushing or a rosacea rash versus an inflammatory rash could be a good, uh, would be helpful. And then the other, uh, other rashes that we can see are on the chest area. So they look like ringworm, but they are not itchy. They sometimes are painful and they just keep on increasing in size. So um, at times um, when, it, when it comes for the first time, often patients describe it like it looks like a ringworm, but it is not itchy. So that is something that you can keep in mind if a rash is just uh, red, inflamed, and looks like a ringworm, it's not itchy, and it just keeps on growing in size. Uh, and it is on the sun exposed areas like RV area with uh, uh, on the chest or could be on the back or upper extremities. So just keep that uh, picture in mind. And sometimes the rash could look, look different in people of color. It could be more thick, uh, the uh, because of the chronicity, which means like it has been going on for a long time and it could have uh, flaky or um, it could have like a, a flaky pattern or a scaly pattern that shows that the rash has been just going on. The inflammation has been going on for a long time. So just knowing that the rash could look different, but knowing where the rash is occurring and if it is painful burning or has is getting worse or getting bigger would all, is all, always ha helpful. Again, rash could be different. So if the rash is unusual and does not fit the pattern of what we would see normally does not mean that it is not lupus related. So always keep in mind something new or something which is not getting better and has been there for a long time comes after sun exposure could be lupus related. So uh, the next common symptom is joint pain. Uh, so when do we get worried about joint pain? Joint pain uh, is, is there, lupus changes our body so much from inside that we do feel um, the pain uh, stiffness very different. So uh, we should get worried if we start noticing that the pain is present all the time. It is not getting better. It's worse when we wake up in the morning uh, just because our joints are not in use in the morning. So when we wake up, they feel rigid. They feel as if you have gloves on and you cannot make a fist. So that kind of symptom when it is worse in the morning gets better with like just regular movement is uh, a key sign that there is significant inflammation in the joints. Uh, often it 
it is involved it involves more than two joints at a time but it could occur in one joint so just keeping in mind the key symptoms would be a good idea and if you start noticing swelling in the joints that would be again another size if we cannot fit our rings um, correctly they get stuck at the joint that probably means either there is a jo uh, some kind of arthritis that is occurring or there is a joint swelling or if the joints look red hot inflamed so those are all signs that if the pain gets worse, it's worse in the morning, gets better with activity. If it is swollen and we cannot fit our uh, um, rings um, or they get stuck at our joints, or if there is red hot swollen joints, those are all signs that we should be monitoring for symptoms. So uh, the deformities or like when the joints look um, change forever does not happen that common in lupus, but just be aware that in case the joints, uh, the fingers are turning or they look a little bit knobby uh, as, and they, they, are bend, they are not like moving correctly or you cannot straighten them out, that means that there could be some kind of inflammation going on in the tendons. So you should call your doctor as soon as possible. Now moving on to ulcers in the mouth. So we often talk about sores in the mouth, uh, but lupus causes a different kind of ulcer or sore. So ulcer is more like a wound inside the mouth. It, it is uh, not a bump, but, but it is like a cavity or um, depression. And sometimes it can be painful, sometimes it cannot be painful. So just knowing that if it is feeling like a raw open area and it feels like sometimes like a cavity or it is painful, that could be a sign of lupus flare. Uh, and then it's most common on the top of the palate or the top palate, and it, but it can occur on the cheek, like the inside of the cheeks or on the tongue too. And next we talk about kidney lupus because kidney lupus is one of the most common severe manifestations of lupus. Just looking at your urine can sometimes help. Um, as we can see in this figure um, that there, if a urine, if you allow the urine to stand, um, there should not be anything which looks like foamy or frothy. But if there is protein in the urine, there would be this froth on the top of the urine that looks as if there is a lot of foaminess or soapiness in the, uh, in the urine. That is a very uh, concerning sign if you start noticing that even after letting the urine stand for several minutes, there is soapiness or foaminess to the urine. You should call your doctor as soon as possible and get a urine test done. Um, sometimes we also refer this to as like a beer head because just because the top is frothy and bubbly as we would see <laughs> in, um, on top of beer. Um, and then if you start noticing swelling around your ankles, around your eyes, that would be another sign that you need to monitor your blood pressure or call your doctor as soon as possible. And then monitoring blood pressure is something that all patients should be doing either at their primary care's office or if they have kidney lupus or have uncontrolled blood pressure, they should be monitoring blood pressure at home as well. And now we talked about some kind of heart, uh, some heart and lung disease that can occur in patients with lupus. We should all never ignore chest pain because chest pain could mean a lot in patients with lupus. It could show, it could be a sign of inflammation. It could be a sign of heart disease that's occurring. And it could be a sign of some kind of damage that is occurring. So we should never ignore a chest pain. Chest pain is a symptom that you need to call your primary care. Uh, you need to call your doctor as soon as possible. And some characteristics, um, we should all be aware that if the chest pain gets worse with activity, better with rest, it means that there is a circulation issue and there could be some artery clogged up because of inflammation or because of um, atherosclerosis or clock. Or if the chest pain is sharp, uh, squeezing gets worse when you lie down flat, um, and that is another thing that you need to keep in mind because that could be a sign that there could be inflammation or fluid around the heart. 
And if the chest pain gets worse when you take deep breaths, that could be a sign that there could be inflammation around the lung lining. So those uh, chest pain should, uh, should never be ignored, period. And other things that we can monitor is that sometimes uh, as female patients, we might not experience chest pain. We might experience some different symptoms which are, are known as angina equivalent, which just means that we often do not portray or present with the same symptoms that we should, uh, the textbook says. So shortness of breath with regular activities, if you can climb a flight of stairs without getting huffy puffy on the top, it means, uh, and now you, you are getting a little winded or feeling huffy puffy, it means that you need to get evaluated as soon as possible. Any kind of cough or bringing up blood into in your sputum or phlegm, that's not normal. So those would be some symptoms to keep a close eye on. And if those are occurring, you need to call your doctor right away. Or if the pain is getting uh, severely worse, you need to go to the ER. So those could be another thing to monitor about. So self-care, um, uh, this is a self-care tool uh, from Lupus Initiative again, and just wanted to highlight that um, uh, the tool um, highlights uh, or helps you track your new symptoms when they started to make, prepare a journal, and also helps you document the key things that you should be um, uh, monitoring. And then there are other portals to help uh, uh, other uh, educators and patients through Lupus uh, Initiative. And then there are other, uh, we uh, also created a website where we have uh, symptoms and symptom tracker uh, and all the information is curated from our, uh, from medication, medical, medical lit literature review. So that could also come in handy. So finally, just wanted to thank you all for your attention and um, just wanted to let you know that we are all in this together, um, your providers, you yourself, your families, and we will help um, uh, or support you as you want. Thank you. Um, now, I think there are some questions that are in the Q&A session and I have some that I came up with as well. So I'm going to ask these people, feel free to keep typing your questions in. If you type them in, I will say what they are. Otherwise, if you want to raise your hand, we can do it that way too. But I see right now there are four questions in the Q&A, and I have several of my own as well, Shivani. So I'm going to start with these. And I'm sure if one person has the question, so many times several people have questions. Um, the first question I have says, prescribed, I apologize for my pronunciation in advance, sulfasalazine by my rheumatologist. Is this potentially making me feel worse? Also, should we tell doctors we are quote unquote allergic to sulfa drugs? Sorry, can you talk about, uh, can you repeat the allergic part uh, of the question again? Um, which part do you want me to repeat, Shivani? part, like, should we talk, uh, tell our doctor that we are aller uh, allergic to? Is that correct interpretation? Yeah. What she asked was, should we be telling our doctors we're allergic to sulfa drugs? Maybe just as a way for them to be aware. Mm -hmm. I I'm guessing that's what she meant. She can clarify that if she wants. Um, mm -hmm. But should we be telling our doctors we're allergic to sulfa drugs or that we're just hypersensitive to them? Yeah, that's a great question. So... Um, often we do not use sulfur containing medications in um, our practice, but everybody's practice is different. So it might, if you're not feeling good after being started on sulfasalazine and you do have lupus, it might be a good idea to start a conversation with your doctor uh, that you're not feeling better, maybe feeling worse. So just a good idea to start that conversation. Um, then the second part, uh, t telling the top, uh, doctor about being allergic. So I think allergy can be perceived in several things because if you put an allergy and you do not have an allergy, 
sulfur, like low quantities can be in different things. So we don't want that like good things, which can, which do not lead to reactions, not to be given to lupus patients. So report allergy, if you have an allergy, but you should uh, make your providers aware that there, there, there are some reports about this hypersensitivity. So do you need to be a, a concerned about being on the sulfur medication? Or if there is an alternative, like uh, mostly there are several alternatives that could be used. So that could be a good, that's a good idea to bring up, um, to start a discussion with your provider. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question I have here, and I'm actually gonna piggyback on this question because I do have some questions about this as well. The question that was asked in the Q&A is, is the third dose or the booster recommended for lupus patients? And then my question regarding that, is there any circumstances where you would not want that patient to have it just specific to certain medications, a specific lupus patient is on that? Or would you pretty much recommend that booster for all lupus patients? That's again a great question. So booster, um, so the new categories that got approved recently does have a chronic medical condition category. So all lupus patients, regardless of what medications they're on, should be um, should be getting the booster vaccine. A uh, few uh, few conditions or few um, uh, presentations or scenarios where I would be a little bit cautious with a booster is uh, a if a patient had severe uh, allergic reaction to the vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, the other scenario is sometimes. Uh, patients had COVID, then they had their booster and the booster is an immune response. So they can feel strongly after or strong immune reactions after, but it's not quantifiable as an allergic reaction. So I might want the patients to maybe consider taking a Tylenol um, on the day of vaccine or maybe the day after. Um, so that could be like one kind of scenario that could be brought up that um, with a provider, and I often bring that up with my patients too, that uh, I felt too bad after the COVID vaccine makes me feel nervous about getting this booster. So can I take this to help? Or can, could I do anything to prevent that kind of immune reaction? Just because feeling achy, sore, though we know it's good that your body is responding, but sometimes if we have to do our job, having a headache, feeling achy, sore is not the best feel. Um, certain conditions, um, and just to remember that when we say uh, like a chronic medical condition, which where lupus qualifies, uh, the duration between first two doses and booster is different. If you are on a medication which qualifies under immunosuppressant category versus you are just on hydroxychloroquine or maybe on no medications. So the booster for patients who are on medications for immunosuppressant, uh, are on immunosuppressant medications is within 20, after 28 days of dose two. But if you are not on immunosuppressants, you're just on hydroxychloroquine, or maybe you are on other medication, uh, you're not on any medications for lupus, uh, then your uh, gap or like your wait period is six months. So you need to do your dose one, dose two, and then six months, months after your dose two, you get your booster. And then the last scenario, which comes to my mind is that being aware that uh, the booster is not the same dose for Moderna, it's a half a dose booster. So just being aware and sometimes just asking ahead is not a bad idea because it's your help. It's, uh, it's never a bad idea to bring up a question. It's always an intelligent question that you bring up because it's your health and we want the best for you. And then finally is that Johnson & Johnson, still the booster is uh, not approved. We might hear that from, uh, in, in the future. So those would be the key things that I would keep in mind. Uh, boosters, again, um, are good, especially if you're on an immunosuppressant. 
studies have shown that immunosuppressants do tend to decrease, the, uh, like not decrease, but the antibody response is not at that level. So the booster actually brought it to the level that they saw in patients who were not on immunosuppressant therapy. So yeah, boosters is, is a good idea, uh, but just knowing what happened with the previous vaccines uh, would be would help you to plan this booster better, and then just knowing which category you are in and which booster, uh, which vaccination you're getting would all be helpful. Thank you. Um, I have quite a few more, Shivani. Mm -hmm. Oh, another question I have here is: Is it true that only the early morning sun between seven a.m. and nine a.m. generates vitamin D? And as we get older, is it harder to convert sunshine into vitamin D? So that's a great question. I think it's the UV rays. So the UV rays penetrate through the skin and then skin converts it into an active form of vitamin D that helps uh, retain, um, that helps with the, all the hormonal and metabolic activities. Uh, so it's basically the... Uh, UV rays. So UV rays are there even in winters, but, but it is just that the UV index is not that high. So we cannot convert that great, uh, especially in winters like in Wisconsin. So, uh, so I think um, vitamin D happens all uh, like conversion happens all the time when we are out in the sun, but with sunscreen, sometimes that conversion can be tricky because we are uh, uh, preventing the UV rays to penetrate our skin. So that's why we would recommend, like we usually recommend just taking those supplements. Often lupus patients are on steroids. So that makes that max, makes it a little tricky too, because steroids can reduce vitamin D levels in the body. It has that catabolic effect. So just knowing um, uh, that's why we always supplement calcium and vitamin D in patients on steroids. So those two things would be a good idea a good idea to keep. Um, over period, like age, uh, the conversion could be different just because maybe uh, there are different uh, factors that come into play. Um, so it could be different. Um, I can like look into literature, like how age affects um, uh, vitamin D conversion. Okay. I might Thank turn you. on my lights. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next question I have is from someone who's newly diagnosed. So this is a great question. How to know when I have a flare versus it's just a different maybe lupus issue? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And I think um, from a, a new diagnosis perspective, I, I feel what I tell is um, look for how did you, uh, what were your symptoms when you got diagnosed with lupus? Um, keep a track of those symptoms. Uh, so journal is a really good idea by keeping a track of like, what were the symptoms? I got diagnosed with a rash. Maybe the joints were swollen. Uh, maybe it was my kidneys and I was noticing puffy eyes. So those symptoms, tracking those symptoms could be the first start. So if you're not developing those, it's a good sign that those are not coming back. But then looking at the other symptoms that we talked about, um, are the joints stiff? If, if I never had joint stiffness, it's very hard to understand like what joint stiffness means. So just no, noticing if it is something different. So journal it. And what I recommend is that you should monitor it over a period of time. So obviously severe symptoms, chest pain, you should not like monitor over a period of time, just call your doctor. But certain symptoms like I feel achy today, maybe I have a knee pain, um, the other day it's my ankle. So just monitor those symptoms. Like if it is persistent every day, maybe it is, uh, it is related with your lupus. And then final thing is that when in doubt, never a bad idea to call your doctor because we are here for you. We want to help you uh, initially when you get diagnosed. It is very difficult. It's challenging. It's life changing. Now you, you went from no medication to maybe six medications. It's different. It's life is different. Your body is different. So we're here to help. So if you're in doubt, it does not make sense calling the doctor never hurts. So those would be my recommendations and hopefully that helps you. Thank you. 
Um, I have a couple questions that came in in chat and I'm going to ask those as well. This one is a really good question. I had this question myself is, should the flu shot be taken weeks away from taking the COVID booster shot? That's a great question. So uh, there are no guidelines, but it might be a good idea because previously when they rolled out all vaccinations, they wanted patients not to take any other vaccination for 14 days. What I have commonly seen, maybe uh, wait a week or uh, two and then get your booster done. Okay. Oh, and sorry, then flu shot done or vice versa. Okay, so either way, but have them maybe space them a week or two apart. Yeah, for two reasons that we do not exactly know that if there is an interaction or if it can reduce the antibody production for COVID vaccine. And the second thing is you don't want to two vaccines which can make you feel sore. So you just oh. space them out and feel a little better. Okay, um, and here's another question and this is really a good one too. Should we also be taking um, the vitamin K2 with our vitamin D? So vitamin K can be tricky, uh, especially if you are um, like vitamin K, we don't have like enough studies on like whether uh, it can, um, it would be relevant with patients with lupus. And I sometimes get a little bit worried because uh, there are some antibodies in patients with lupus that can increase the risk of blood clots. So if you take mm -hmm. vitamin K, which can increase the risk of clot, not that much, but can increase the risk of clotting. So it would be a little bit tricky. So specifically taking vitamin K would not be a great idea talk with your doctor. Uh, but the second thing would be just taking a multivitamin would not hurt because that's balanced out based on everybody's uh, nutrition, like average nutrition. Um, and when you speak about an antibody for clotting, would you then suggest, and I think this is what this would be is, so someone who has like an antiphospholipid antibody should probably not be taking the vitamin K. Yeah, because if they have antiphospholipid antibody, or they have antiphospholipid syndrome, um, they probably would be on blood thinners. So vitamin K is contra, like it's antagonizing what the blood thinner is doing. Okay, contraindicated. Yep. Okay, um, here is another good one. And I know this is probably gonna have a huge variance in the answer, but how long does a lupus flare typically last? It can be different. So. Yeah. Everybody's flare is different. Everybody's body is different. Sometimes mild flares can take uh, resolve by itself or maybe rest uh, can help. Uh, hydration sometimes can help. But often if it is a moderate to severe flare or if it is a flare with a rash um, and the sun exposure is continued or the trigger is continued or if there is a flare of the kidneys, um, it stays till the time we take care of it. So yeah, so some things um, to keep in mind that if it is not getting better, so probably might need a little boost to the medications to help it, help control it. Thank you. Um, here's another one. Um, are people with lupus more sensitive to the paralytic used during surgery? And does the body clear the drugs slower than other people would? So not much reports on the sensitivity to anesthetic agents or uh, paralytic agents. Uh, not a great, um, uh, lupus patients do not metabolize or clear medications differently. It is when, um, in general, but in case you have kidney, uh, involvement or you have liver involvement, those could be conditions where the metabolism looks different. But in general, if everything or the function, kidney liver function are normal, we should not metabolize our medications differently, though there could be some medications which can interact and can lead to um, different metabolism. Um, this one, I might mispronounce a word, so I'll do my best. Um, it sounds very specific, and this might deal with estrogen a little bit too. I'm not really sure, Shivani. Mm -hmm. Could the reason or purpose for microchimerism in women be the reason for higher frequency of lupus in women compared to men? And does microchimerism 
possibly prevent an allergic reaction in a woman to the presence of a male fetus? That's interesting. I'm not sure if microchimerism is, uh, let's see. I'm not familiar with that either. Yeah. So the, it probably, I can just tell that we are still trying to research is going on about genetic focus. So probably we are talking about genetics. So we have 26 genetic fo uh, foci that are of interest, but still we have not found like the, re the actual fo uh, foci that we can monitor regularly. And uh, we can predict that these patients would develop lupus. So it's work in progress. We are getting there. Uh, but uh, still, we don't have like that clarification. Uh, I can, uh, again, like highlight that uh, there could be a role uh, from that extra X chromosome. But again, this is all like hypothetical based on like very uh, bench, re uh, bench re or basic science research not seen in like bigger studies. So, but there could be an X chromosome related effect because uh, male patients tend to have less lupus because they have only one X chromosome, but there is a category called Kleinfelter syndrome where there yeah. are two X chromosomes with a Y chromosome. So in those patients, uh, they tend to have 14 times higher risk of lupus compared to male patients. So there could be that there could be some genes that we need to figure out on the X chromosome, but works in progress. So it would like say we still we are know a lot about lupus, but we are trying to know more about lupus. Um, I'm thinking back to some of your discussion you had about um, the incidence of the heredity statistics mm -hmm. on that correlation. And you had mentioned twins and I think siblings. I was wondering if I could broaden this question and you may or may not know the answer. You may have some generalities. I'm wondering if you have the statistics on a mother-daughter relationship, and then also a familial relationship that isn't necessarily the disease, but saying, I have lupus, what is the probability of one of my siblings having a different autoimmune disease like MS or diabetes or ankylosing spondylitis or something like that? Yeah, so uh, the, that, uh percentage is almost similar to fraternal twin per percentage because the genetic makeup is almost similar to a fraternal twin genetic makeup, makeup or maybe less. So it's five to 10% for uh, first degree family members. So mother, daughter, or maybe um, father, daughter. Um, uh, so those would be like 5%, five to 10%. Uh, and it is general for any kind of autoimmune disease. So it's not just lupus. So if family member has lupus, uh, then they can have higher risk of having rheumatoid arthritis or vice versa that the, fam uh, the family member has rheumatoid arthritis and now the patient is presenting with lupus symptoms. So there is an autoimmunity hereditary predisposition and uh, that's five to 10% in first degree relatives. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna try to get the last questions in, Shafani. I wanna be really respectful of your time, but I still have a few more here. Mm -hmm. um, this one is pretty specific. I've had both the Moderna shot six months ago and I've had a Pfizer booster as soon as it was available to Im immunocompromised patients and I've had no negative reactions. So that's really more of a comment that I don't even think that's the recommendation currently that you mix vaccines. I know there's studies being done on that now but I'm glad that this person is happy with the result that they got. I don't know if you, you wanna to speak to that at all, like mixing the vaccines, doing two of Pfizer and one of Moderna or vice versa. Yeah, that's a great uh, point. Uh, for now, no, it's not recommended to mix the vaccines just because the literature is not there. So sometimes like if it is not effective, we would not know because you're not doing like an antibody response in everybody. So yeah, would not, Re recommend at the moment, but things are fluid. And uh, that's what I've learned in COVID pandemic, things are fluid. So it might change in the future, but yeah, we should stick to the recommendations that no mixing and try to 
get the booster of the CDs that you got previously. Okay. Um, the next couple here is, um, is there any correlation between systemic lupus and extremely dark eye circles? Like, like the big circles you get mm -hmm. your eyes? Um, or do you think it's just genetics, sleep? Yeah, could uh, so I would say that if there was a rash there, um, like red inflamed rash, and now you have darkening or a skin um, skin looks uh, different or the pigmentation looks different, it could be lupus related. Often when we see these uh, rashes that occur for several weeks or months, they can cause color changes inside the skin, and it can either look lighter or darker. And, um, and it takes time to even out. So it all depends on what initially there, what it, how it started and then what led to the dark circle. So, yep. Um, and I think I'll just ask you like two more cause we're getting close to our seven o'clock time and I wanna be very respectful of everyone's time. Um, this one is interesting and I think I've experienced this myself. A lot of people might have. I keep injuring tendons in various parts of my body. Is this likely due to lupus? So that's common. Like uh, a lot of times, that's why you would not see a lot of uh, erosions of like bone destruction in patients with lupus because the inflammation is often in tendons. So sometimes patients do present with different tendonitis and two, three tendons inflamed at the same time. So yeah, could be because of lupus as long as there is no injury explaining uh, the tendon uh, tendonitis. So if it seems spontaneous or erroneous, it could be from lupus. Like, yeah, you can't point to an injury for it. Yep. Um, and here will, I think this will be our last one. Um, can lupus also cause blood clots? So great question. Lupus in general, when that inflammation is really high, uh, and that's some of our work that's going on, it can increase the risk of blood clots. And then um, the antiphospholipid antibody that we talked about is very common and, and mostly like most common second, secondary, which means like uh, it's most commonly seen in patients with lupus compared to other autoimmune disease. Um, so that makes it uh, the other risk factor to have blood clot. So, um, and if you have kidney lupus, that's other uh, risk factor comes that comes to my mind. Uh, kidney lupus uh, causes inflammation, makes you dump out all the good protein in your urine. So when you have uh, dumping out all the protein, all these uh, anticoagulants in the body are protein. So we are paying out almost all protein and increases the risk of blood clot. So very severe inflammation, um, antiphospholipid sy syndrome more commonly, and then lupus, kidney lupus, which probably is part of that very severe inflammation are the common causes. And then um, some of our work is focused on looking at lupus, uh, and that is a known fact that lupus is an independent cause of uh, stroke in heart disease. So that, again, it's, it's a different kind of clot, but um, again, uh, probably lupus related along with other factors. Um, one more question that's really general and I can't resist, so I'm gonna ask it. Um, I've had lupus for, let's see, 32 years. So a very long time. As a physician, and, and my treatment has changed so much over the course of my, my illness. As a physician, could you tell us all, like if you were to have your quote unquote dream patient, what are the most important pieces of information like to utilize our doctor appointments really efficiently? What are the most important questions or what are the most important things we can tell you when we come into your office? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, most important things um, which I would want to know or which I ask all my patients is like, um, how are their previous symptoms doing of lupus? Um, how are uh, any new symptoms? And then we go over a list of our symptoms, often call it a symptom tracker. And then um, talk about how their medications are going. So just knowing like uh, struggling with medications and, and a uh, doctor is a family member. So be open. If you are struggling with medications, 
us knowing would help you or help lupus because we're in this together. So talking about medication, struggles about medication, maybe side effects. So just openly talking about those. And then um, in general, anything comes up about like, I read this and this is my concern. So anything new comes up to your mind, new concerns or new things which causes stress. And then um, I often want to know how you're feeling. Like, are you stressed? Are you having an emotional breakdown? Is pandemic not, is like making you feel even worse or is there somebody who can help you? So those kind of questions always help uh, not just uh, treat lupus, but help you feel better because at the end, we don't, we just are not here to treat your lupus and then that's, that's done. We are, our job is done. We want you to feel better living with lupus, more confident living with lupus. So those are the things that you can prepare ahead of time. Sometimes the journal, the track, uh, the track mm -hmm. journal helps like patients bring, they have noted everything down. I remember, uh, I know most mm -hmm. of the patients have polyness, which is normal, like which is just so, so overwhelming disease and then so many symptoms that you can get polyness. So just that journal helps and they bring all the symptoms in like maybe their iPad, maybe their phone or maybe their um a notebook or maybe a friend who remembers everything so that that is the way to like uh, uh jot everything down and be open about what you're feeling and how you're feeling there is no why everybody is different so i don't mm -hmm. think nobody anybody judges it is just we want you to feel better thank you um thank dr you. dr garg thank you so much i we got through most of the questions that were Still a couple left, so I apologize. Jordi, I want to thank Dr. Garg for her time. This was an excellent presentation. And I just want to hand it back to Dawn for a minute to kind of give a little conclusion for us or. Sure, well, I just wanted to thank Dr. Garg and thank everyone else for um, joining us tonight. Um, please keep an eye out um, each month for the Chapter Network. Let's talk about it. On presentations. So um, thanks again to everyone. We hope that you learned something uh, tonight. And uh, so have a good night.